Hello, thanks for coming to our session. We appreciate it. So my name is Lisa Green, and I have two children, well, not children really so much anymore, but young adults with cystic fibrosis. My son Jacob is 19, and my daughter Casey is 17. Did I mention the word teenagers? How many of you here have a teenager in the home? Raise your hand. Shall we have a moment of silence? Indeed, you know what I mean when I say teenagers. So I could share a lot of stories, as you might be able to, you might imagine, about raising two kids with cystic fibrosis, but one I'm going to share with you is about my son and his scouting experience. He's been in scouts since being a Cub Scout at age seven. Becoming an Eagle Scout is sort of the well-known pinnacle of scouting, but another not so well-known but equally um, achievement, achieving, is attending Philmont Scout Ranch. And this is a picture from their website. Their website says, uh, Philmont Scout Ranch is the Boy Scouts' premier high adventure camp. Philmont challenges scouts with more than 214 square miles of rugged northern New Mexico wilderness. Wow. <laughs> wilderness is right. Rugged is right. Barren is right. There's no electricity, there's no power, there's no services, there's no cell phones, there is nothing. So imagine my, shall I say, concern when my then 15-year-old son comes up to me and says, Mom, guess what? Our troop is going to go to Philmont Ranch this summer. It's going to be so cool. And we're going to go see dinosaur bones, and there's an airplane wreck, and we get to hike 110 miles in 11 days, and we're going to eat trail mix. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So inside of me, right, I'm going, oh my gosh, no, right? I mean, the inner helicopter parent is like, you know, alert, 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 warning, warning, right? But on the outside, I'm like, okay, Jake, wow, yeah, that sounds interesting. That sounds exciting. I can see why a Boy Scout would want to do that. And have you thought about how you might take care of your, yourself while you're on a trip like this? Well, my son Jacob, being the resourceful and industrious young man that he is, he is after all a boy scout, says, in complete anticipation of his mother, he says, well, mom, yes I have. I have my portable nebulizer and I have ice packs for my meds and I can go every other day on my palmazyme as long as I'm doing my hypertonic saline every single day. Plus, I can bring my acapella for my breathing treatments, and I'm going to be exercising a whole lot. So I think it should be just fine. Wow. And he said it just like that. I think he rehearsed this a few times, right, knowing what his mother was going to say, being the helicopter that she is, who tries valiantly not to be. All right. So another deep breath. I'm torn. I want Jake so desperately to go to this. I get that it's important for him as a young man, as a scout, as a boy, to live, to learn, to grow, as a person, as a person without CF, and as a person with CF. All of these things are running through my mind. I'm torn. I so much want him to go. But the what ifs are also there. We've worked so hard for so many years to, to keep him healthy. What, what if he goes in his lung function, plummets, never to return again? So many things, drugs, and you know, the, the hope of a cure is right there on the horizon. What if we lose so much lung function that he can't take advantage of this? All for a trip? Oh my goodness. All these fears, all these things are running through my mind. But I also recognized how important this was for him. And my husband and I, over the years, have really, really tried to say, instead of saying, no, you can't because of CF, we've really tried to say, yes, you can, and what's your plan? Yes, you can, and what's your plan for the sleepover, for the summer camp, for the, the trip, whatever, the school trip? And so now it was like, yes, you can, and what's your plan for Philmont, right? Jake had a plan, but it was time to pull in the big guns. <laughs> time to go to the experts. So I told Jake, all right, that sounds good. Let's go talk to the team. Let's see what they have to say about this. Now, inside, of course, I'm hoping. What am I hoping? I'm hope. No. Yes, right. You guys know. Yeah. I'm hoping that they say no, and then I don't have to be the bad guy, right? 
Well, I know my CF team, and they're very, very supportive. So I thought, you know, that's probably not going to happen. And I was right. In fact, Dr. Gibson was outright excited for Jacob to go. <laughs> and of course, inside, I'm like, oh, darn. <laughs> but on the outside, and, and I am, because I'm torn. I want him to go. I'm just afraid. And I don't want to let my own fear stop this young man from living his dreams. And so we went to see the CF clinic. And Dr. Gibson, this is a picture of our team. Um, and he's kind of on the back row to the right over there. But anyway, uh, so we, you know, sit down in clinic and uh, one look at me, Dr. Gibson, one look at me and tells the whole story. And he sees a worried mom who's scared to death, who's trying to be supportive. So he says, he, overcome, he overcomes that. He addresses it right away. He says, Jake, I know that your mom is concerned that your health is going to suffer through this trip. It's going to be a hard trip. It's going to be a difficult trip. There's going to be tough conditions on the trail. There's high altitude. There's dust. There's a uh, possibility of dehydration. We've got a lot to talk about, young man. Let's do it. So we sat down, and we were probably with him for an hour. And we sat down, and we went through all the details. He, they came up. And I tried, as a mom, to sit and, and keep my mouth shut, right, which is not always easy. How many of you find it hard to keep your mouth shut when you're in the room in the clinic, right? Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, but, you know, I really tried. And they would, you know, Dr. Gibson was good about saying, and what do you think, Lisa? What do you think about this? So we had this interactive conversation, and they came up with a plan um, that we all felt comfortable with, which I really, really appreciated him taking the time. Um, and so we, they came up with a plan, and then we agreed to have a final checkup before the trip. So we went to work. We went to work making it happen. Now this is a slide of Jake at Philmont, just to show you <laughs> the conditions. As you can see, the food all over the ground and whatnot. If I'd seen these pictures before he went, I don't know if I would have been quite so gung-ho. But anyway, no, I would have been, because it was a great trip for him. But anyway, the boys went to work on making it happen. Oh, and I forgot to mention. So one other thing that gave me comfort was that my husband, Carl, was going to go with him. And because my husband was an assistant troop leader. So I had that real sense of, OK, Carl's with him if things go really bad, Carl can get him help, whatever it would take. He would ride the donkey if it took it, right? He would get help for my son. So anyway, so the boys went to work um, on, uh, you know, getting, getting ready to go. They exercised, they put heavy books in their backpacks and went up and down the, you know, the hills by our house. And they did some, uh, you know, mountain climbing in our local Washington state area. So, but also I wanted Jake to be in charge of and taking responsibility for figuring out he, how he would make it work at Philmont. So I assigned him the task of figuring out power and ice. So after doing some digging, he came back to me and said, bad news, mom. They don't have power and they don't have ice. And I was like, oh boy, that is a really big problem. So we sat down together on the speakerphone and we called Philmont and started really digging deep. And we found out that the particular route that they were going to be going on did have a couple of service cabins along the way that would have some power and ice. And they assured us that they could accommodate us. They do accommodate boys with you know, medical conditions and that we could make this work. OK, whew, all right. We're getting there. So my, my inner helicopter is starting to come in for a landing. I'm starting to feel a little more comfortable, right? So um, we walked through the plan and uh, got it done. And Jake took off, in, or Jake got his uh, checkup done. They cleared him for travel. And the big day arrives. This is a picture of base camp. Um, so of course, I had the, the job of taking my husband and Jacob you know, to the bus, where they would then go to the airport, you know, and then they would then go to, on the plane to New Mexico. And it, it was so hard not to be joyful and excited. I mean, their, their exuberance was just overflowing. And it, but it was so hard for me, because I wanted to be excited, but I was also really, really scared. I mean, the, the inside of me was like thinking, Gosh, is this the last time I'm going to see my son healthy? I mean, and I didn't want to be as morbid as thinking, is this the last time I'm going to see my son? But I thought, what if the mule kicks him over a cliff? You know, it wasn't the CF stuff, right? It was just this, this Boy Scout stuff that I don't get. I mean, I don't get this. I just don't get it. But I think it's cool that other people do. I mean, that's why we're all different. But anyway, so, so, so I'm, I'm really trying to be excited, and I was. I was really trying to share in the joy. Plus, I really wanted him to have fun. I'm like wondering, you know, what, what is this going to be like for him? So I kissed him goodbye, and I 
bid them good luck and have a safe trip. And of course, I went home and I cried. So, 11 days. 11 days, no contact. No, no cell phones, no calls, no nothing. But after 11 days, uh, I got the call, finally. And my, my husband, they had gone 11 days with no showers. So before they even got into the shower, as soon as I got into cell service, my husband called me. And he's like, Jake, the first thing he said was, Jake is fine. We had an amazing time. I can't wait to see you. We're going to take a shower and we're throwing the sleeping bags away. <laughs> that was pretty much, uh, you know, his synopsis. So 110 miles, 11 days, and Jake was fine. Uh, he lost a couple of pounds because of, you know, trail food is not that high fat, high calorie, uh, especially for what they were burning. Um, and the nebulizer batteries did die and they ran out of ice. And so there was about three or four days in there without doing nebulizers. But Jake was okay and he survived and there were no ill effects. He was healthy. But most importantly, Jacob had the trip of a lifetime with his dad, with his father and the other boys he went with and bonded with and the other men, amazing men that went with them. That these experiences that will always be a part of him. He learned about himself and his own limitations. He learned that when all the boys wanted to really push their limits and go on a little extra side hike, that he needed to say, you know what, I need to take a break right now. I need to rest. I need to do my breathing treatments. I was so proud of him when I heard that. He, he learned how far he could push himself. He sat on a plateau, this picture here, with lightning all around. He saw views of the stars that few people will ever see. And he saw his dad take charge of a really stubborn mule that no one else could get to move. And if you don't get the mule to move, nobody moves. You can't just leave it, right? So it was a real dilemma. And so he, he got to experience those things, all of those important things. He encountered walls and he overcame them. He got to be a man. He got to be normal. He got to be free. He got to live. And this is the part of Jake that his care team doesn't see. This is the part of Jake that they don't know, but yet they still appreciate. They understand that this is an important part of living, that it's not just about cystic fibrosis. It's about living and living well. Jake created memories of a lifetime with his father, who less than two years later would pass away unexpectedly of a heart attack. Oddly enough, it wasn't Jake's health that was an issue at that time. My husband had a ticking time bomb in his own chest. And if only we had known. But yet, somehow, it makes that experience that Jacob had all the sweeter, all the more poignant, all the more meaningful, and all the more precious. Because he, couldn't, he could never do it again. He could never do it again. And it's in, in part thanks to a CF team who said, yes, you can. This is our plan. Let's make a plan. And their belief in Jacob, their belief in us, and a belief that life is indeed to be lived, that the quality of life must be balanced with the burden of care. Otherwise, what's the point? Because at the end of the day, at the end of all of our lives, all we really have is our memories. The memories, the experiences, the joy, the love that we share with each other. And I am forever grateful to Dr. Gibson and the Seattle Children's CF team. They recognize that my kids are so much more than CF. They help my husband and I learn how to say, yes, you can, what's your plan? So that together we can help our kids live well with CF and live well. Fast forward to today, my son Jacob is a sophomore living in a dorm at Stanford University in California, which is a huge achievement, as I know all of you know. My daughter Casey is still living with me, but she's attending a dual, she's attending college tool it's too. It's a dual enrollment program where she does high school and college at the same time. And you know, it's kind of funny because she actually started college, she's two years younger, like a week before Jake, and she's just like nanner nanner, you know. <laughs> so they had this cute little competition going, you know, and you know, Jake's like, Yeah, my chemistry class is harder than yours, and she's like, nanner nanner. <laughs> so it's really cute. 
we're enjoying life. I'm a public speaker, as some of you know. I travel around the country and uh, do presentations at Ed Days, CF Ed Days, and other audiences. I've written four books about parenting children with health issues. I, I do my best. I'm not perfect, but I do my best to live what I teach. And it is still a process. As much as I know in here, so much of it is what we need to learn and feel in here. And it's a process. It's growing. It's letting go. It's just learning how to do that. And it's a process for my kids, too, learning how to be young adults now without having someone tell them what to do all the time. And it's a, it's a process for my CF team, letting go and trusting us and, and knowing they've taught us well. They've given us the tools. It's a process. It's a process as we all grow and become and learn and live life. Make every moment matter, because every moment does matter. It's important. And I will say I'm so grateful to my CF team and the CF Foundation for giving us hope and the tools for adding more tomorrows. Thank you. Lisa, thanks for that very personal and powerful story. As you heard from Lisa, for people with CF and their families, uh, managing CF and life is, is a balancing act. There are a lot of moving parts. While living with CF is different for everyone, there are, there are some common threads. The treatment plan is highly individualized. And we, we know that people with CF do best when they receive this individualized treatment plan, when they can balance treatments with daily life, and when their care plans address the whole person, not just the physical side, but the mental side and the social side. So we wanna talk a little bit about our approach, approach to care. So when care teams and family caregivers and members of the local and virtual community, such as volunteers and people with CF work together, it can make balancing life a little bit easier. Working together means coordinating across the multiple specialties, both within the care team and beyond the care team, sharing information to drive improvements for everyone and belonging to a supportive community like all of us gathered here today and those who are online today. What we're gonna talk about, um, Cindy and I are gonna go through these four supporting arms that you see on this diagram. But one point that I wanna make is this is, for some people, aspirational. But we think it's important to set out a vision for what we wanna to work towards. So just sort of keep that in mind as you reflect on, on your experience in life and your experience with the care team, that this is, this is an aspirational model that we want to talk about today. I'm going to start by talking about that first arm, coordinating. CF, as you all know, is a complex chronic disease that affects multiple organs and it requires a demanding treatment plan. There's no one size fits all. The treatments must be individualized. Individualized to the health status, to the goals of the patient and family, and to that individual. In partnership with patients and families, these highly trained specialists on the care team apply the latest medical evidence and publish guidelines to their patients' unique circumstances. And that results, hopefully, what we wish for is care that's complete and coordinated and personalized and proactive. So I'm gonna run through some things that fit in this, in this arm of coordinate, coordinating personal care, some of the things that we as a community put in place to support what happens right in that circle in the middle. Lisa 
and her son and her daughter, her family. And the first thing I want to talk briefly about is the center accreditation process. And you may not be familiar with this, but it's a peer review process that's been in place for decades. And this is all about professional accountability, where we have center directors from across the country that on behalf of the foundation visit care centers periodically and they spend a full day there. And they look at the facilities, the inpatient, the outpatient facilities, they visit the labs, make sure the sweat testing lab and the microbiology lab, both important labs for CF patients, they make sure they're up to snuff. And they meet with the institutional leaders and they meet with the CF team and the directors and the nurse coordinators and they want to make sure the institution is really providing the resources needed to deliver good care. After the site visit, we bring the center committee together. They discuss the findings, and we send a critique to the centers. And if there are issues, we ask them to respond to those issues. So this is sort of working in the background, but it's a very important process. And it's the way that we hold those institutions accountable. You all know about the multidisciplinary care teams, the, the docs, the nurses, the nurse coordinators often the heart of the team, social workers, dietitians, respiratory therapists, bringing their special expertise. And of course, there are additional specialists that are often needed, like gastroenterologists and endocrinologists. And, and, and ENT doctors, and for adults, high-risk OBs. It's a good thing that we're having more women with CF having children. Clinical practice guidelines, we bring groups together, experts together. We always include an adult with CF and a parent of a child with CF because that perspective is very important. These guidelines committees, look at the, lit the published literature. They talk to their colleagues. They develop questions that they think the clinicians and patients and families need the answers to. And then they work on pulling that all together with recommendations. And their goal is to publish it in the peer review literature. And we support that that literature is open to the public so anybody across the world can see it. And we develop executive summaries, and these are published on our website. If you haven't looked, you can search our website for guidelines. And it gives a summary of the recommendations. And then we also work on the next generation, recruitment and develop of those individuals that we recruit. We've worked hard on recruiting new adult care providers, and we continue to work hard there on recruiting gastroenterologists, endocrinologists, and we provide small catalyst grants to bring them into the community. Once they're in the community, they're typically hooked and they don't leave. We've also been looking at how do we evolve the care model to meet the growing needs. We've talked a lot about mental health and we've funded care centers to hire part-time mental health coordinators and really pay attention to this important part of CF and any chronic disease. We've also provided some catalyst awards to hire pharmacists. You know, with these new drugs, their drug-drug interactions, their side effects, we think having a pharmacist in the outpatient clinic is going to be very important going forward. Now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Cindy George. Bruce and I are going to tag team, so I'm going to stand up, then he's going to stand up. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the empowering the individual arm. And because cystic fibrosis the complex, is so complex, it's so important that people who are living with cystic fibrosis and families, as many of you know, play that important and active role in care. And this really requires building this trust-based relationship with your care teams so that you can feel that you can bring your contributions in discussing care as really Lisa's story illustrated. And you will know that your contributions and your lived experience, your knowledge of day-to-day -day life is encouraged, it's valued, and it's highly respected. 
this, when these type of relationships are nurtured, they become partnerships. And in partnership with your care team, you can really work together towards addressing your personal goals, as again we saw in Lisa's story for Jacob, and also while maintaining that health that's so imperative. And so the foundation has several initiatives that we have underway to support empowering the individual. We have a multitude of educational resources because self-care starts with knowledge. As the care team Dr. Gibson shared with Jacob, all the thing, com potential complications, it was important that he knew that. I don't know if you've had a chance to go on CFF.org, but we've worked hard in the last several years to really um, build the, the library there that's there and have an interactive um, set of resources for you, as well as talking to your care team. Bruce just mentioned in this morning, he spoke about the large mental health initiative with mental health coordinators, guidelines, several resources about this very important topic and issue. Bruce also mentioned today partnerships for sustaining daily care, where we're really bringing the community together to look at new knowledge and resources to help be more successful in managing the multiple uh, therapies every day. Patient Family Advisory Boards, here's a great way to add your voice, get involved, and make changes in your health care center. I don't know if you have one. If you do, if you consider joining one. If you don't, consider talking to your care team and starting one. The foundation offers some seed money through the Care Center grant that could get you started and enrich your center. Experience of care survey. Your center may or may not participate. Sometimes their uh, institutions might have some barriers there. But if they do, this is a great way to voice how you can improve care at your center. Get involved with them. If you don't, don't feel shy about sharing your perspective about how you and your children are, are experiencing care. Work with your care teams to improve that local care. And Bruce is going to talk about the CF Learning Network, and he did this morning as well. But I want to give a shout out to a special group of folks, and Pam Mertz is standing here, or sitting right there in the beginning, and she's leading this group of what's called Community Innovators as part of the CF Learning Network. And this is a group of parents and families and adults with CF that are working together to create or to improve care, not only for themselves and at their local, but really across all the networks. So, so exciting here, I think, that all these initiatives wrap up to really helping to in, have this active role for individuals with CF and families in a care center in your world, in your health. Let me turn it to Bruce for the next arm. Thank you. So this arm is, is about improving, sharing data to improve health. Care plans are adapted and improved over time based on test results, changes in symptoms, mood, appetite, energy level that patients and families share with their care teams. Data feedback to care teams helps them improve the care they provide to the individual and to their entire patient population. When a patient's data is provided to the patient registry, the effectiveness of treatments after approval we can assess. And in fact, we, we have a manuscript in, pre, in, in press now um, looking at the impact of Kaleidico in the real world setting, in the clinic setting. And it's great news. It lines up perfectly with the clinical trials. This is a game changing drug. So what else are we doing here in this area of sharing data to improve health? You all know about the patient registry and I think it's just one of the crown jewels of the foundation. It's, you know, I'm, I have mentioned I'm a nerd, and it's, in God we trust, all others bring data. We want to see the data. So, and this data, we don't want it to get in the way of the relationships and the caring that, that occurs there in that inner circle of, of this image. But we use that reg the registry for so many different things. The annual report is a detailed report. It's, it's on our website, you can find it. It's more than you'll ever wanna know. You can really geek out looking at that report. Each center, we provide their own special registry report that on every outcome, every process measure, they can see where they stack up as compared to their peers. And risk-adjusted data on some of the most important outcomes is 
is available on our website. You can find your program and other programs and see how they're performing on some of the key metrics. I shared this morning something we're really excited about, a new application that we've deployed, a reporting application that we call CF Smart Reports. And that's that 24-hour cycle. If the centers can get the data in, we can get it back out. I showed that summary report. Has, has anybody seen one of those summary reports at your care center? Raise your hand if you've seen it. Okay, small, not, not enough. Um, please go back to your centers and ask them you want to see the summary report from CF Smart Reports. This has only been deployed literally for six months and we're just pushing it out now. Not everybody's even signed up yet. Uh, but there's tremendous value there. We want you to see these reports. Learning and leadership collaboratives is when we bring teams together from across the country to focus on scientific approach to change using data. Uh, and these have been very successful. They share across teams. We teach them how to standardize and improve. This is in collaboration with our colleagues at Dartmouth. And I talked this morning about learning networks and learning sites. And I'm not going to spend any more time talking about the pilot learning network, but to let you know we connect our community in other ways, sort of dinosaur technology for some of it, like listservs. But our community is very active, sharing questions, improvements, problems. They seek out advice from across the care center network. And then the biggest learning opportunity in our community uh, for care centers and for some patients and families is our North American CF conference, the largest conference in the world. Clinicians, scientists, everybody shares. A lot of great science, a lot of clinical care uh, innovation shared there. Now I'm going to turn it back to my colleague, Cindy. And our fourth arm is belonging to a community. All of you and all of you joining us online are the community. As we know, living with cystic fibrosis is 24-7, so it's a lot. It's clinic visits, it's doing all the therapies, and so much more. So it's so important that we have an informed and empathetic community that we can turn to to help sustain our care, but also to have such a powerful voice as you just had this past Thursday to make sure that there's advocacy for access to this high-quality specialized care in those treatments. And so having a community in which we have our researchers, our clinicians, all of you together in the foundation really make sure that we can share our experiences and our understandings with one another so that no one has to feel alone. And so you've heard many of our programs that we have that are supporting this through the CF Cares, which is that new program the chapters are offering, bringing together families and friends of loved ones so that they can connect. Community partnerships, where Dr. Borowitz talked about several of the um, programs that they have through the virtual events, through the Peer Connect, and through the Community and Research Voice. Through the Advocacy and Access, again with the March on the Hill, that's such a great event. And through our Compass, I see Ozzy back there in the great program that her and her team offer to help people navigate health insurance and all those obstacles. And our volunteers and donors, all of you, and again, all of you online, here in this conference, sharing and learning together and supporting one another. And our CF community blog and social media, whether that be Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, all provide these platforms by which we can kind of greet each other and meet each other in these type of ways, so that together, I think you would agree, the way f is the way forward. And so we have just shown you how our care model has four arms. It was very difficult to tweak these into separate arms. They're pretty much always intertwined. But here we had the coordinating care that Bruce talked about for that personalized care, empowering the individual and families, improving care at both the individual 
and also at the population level, and finally belonging to a community. Again, all of these are intertwined. You know what, at times we were practicing before, I usually use my hands, so we think about them together, but sometimes they can be very dynamic and sometimes very messy. So that's what we've tried to kind of tease them out so you could see all the various elements. And I hope you see that with this approach that it's coordinated and that it's for personalized care and that we hope you know that there's an opportunity, that this is designed to connect individuals and their clinicians, that there is this partnership, much like what happened with Lisa's story, and we hope for all of you, whether now and in the future going forward. So right now I want to turn it to questions and discussions. I don't know if you have any questions. We'll be happy to raise your hand, and we'll go ahead and uh, we're going to see if we need a mic. If not, I'll repeat your questions. Let me ask Sarah, though, are there any online questions? So no, none online. If you do have a question online, please type it in. Yes. I'm going to be your moderator, so. <laughs> for the newly diagnosed says Okay. Bruce, did you want to take that one? Yeah, it's a great question. And we're really working hard on this. Uh, in some communities, the chapter and the care center have a great working relationship. And it's, we're all on the same team. We're trying to accomplish the same things. And in other communities, they're not quite as well connected. So we're, we're doing our due diligence here. We're collecting data and we're trying to find out best practices. There are some places that have this figured out. And we'll be going into another strategic planning uh, effort here before too long. And I think that's going to be one of the focal points. It's how do we improve that relationship and possibly add mission-driven value, perhaps even through our chapters. But we need, to, we need to get closer connections there. So I think there's an opportunity there. Thank you for the question, Drew. I'll, I'll ask one question. Does, does, this, does this make sense to you, the way this all plays out? I think, basically, I think people were dissatisfied with the way I was putting the care model across. It was too nerdy. So um, this, was a, this really sort of gets more at the core of what the care is about. It's that inner circle, the relationship. And then we blend in the data from the nerds uh, to kind of support good decision making. So that's kind of the idea. And we thought kind of laying, and I think Cindy said it very well. I mean, they're, they're, all, inter, they're all intermingled. But when you tease it out, hopefully it's the right degree of support to get it done and get it done well. We don't want to stick our nose in too far into that circle. We just want to be wrapping around and providing the support that's needed. Yeah, I think, did everybody hear that question? It's, it's not being able to get back into clinic for regular visits, and that, that's, that I understand your concern. I would be concerned as well. This is part of that accreditation process to ensure they've got the capacity to see the patients that they're serving. It doesn't always work that way. Um, I guess my advice would be to reach out to whoever you have a um, personal relationship, the best personal relationship, and see if you can get your foot in the door. And if needed, try to get to the institutional leaders, kind of partner with your care team. A lot of times it's they're being constrained 
in some way by the institution and it may be unknowing constraints. And if they go to the institutional leaders, it's a parade of one after another of clinicians saying we need this and that. And the way to do it is to partner. And if there's a parent or a patient that goes with the clinicians and makes the case, sometimes we can crack open the door to get the resources that they need. This is a real concern of ours. This is a real concern of ours, particularly on the adult care side. That, you know, that's just to get the access is sometimes difficult. The docs are often stretched in multiple directions. Lisa, you had a comment? This Sorry. Is This is of a more simple nature, and you've probably already thought of this, if you have, forgive me, but um, our clinic has a scheduler, and so there have been times when I've called Dane and said, look, Dane, this happened. I mean, I really need to get in. Can you, can you watch for me? Can you put me on a wait list? <laughs> there, okay. Yeah, of course. Okay. Yeah. And so that's... And, and then the other piece of that is just, you know, I mean, when he calls and says, can you be here, then it's like, great, you know. I mean, life happens, and we do what we can, but. I, I think we're getting the signal that we've got we've to stop, because there's a short break, and then one, one question, Sue. No, I think, well, it, it may, may be, but if, I think that's where the director can, he, he's going to know where the leverage points are. Or, or do you mean the center director? No, I think go with the center director. Okay. If, if he or she feels like he's not getting the resources needed and the clinic space and the clinic time needed, having that patient partner is, may have the impact. Yeah. It's it's like anything else. You got to work your way in. Once you're once you're in there, then you you can help move it in the direction it needs to move. If, if you all have feedback on what we've discussed, please email me or Cindy or let us know what you think. Is, does, it, does this add up? Does it make sense to you? Does it help you understand the support that we provide a little better? Thank you all.